everyone, welcome. I'm gonna talk for a very short time so that Sandy and Roger have plenty of time to get through all their, um, oh my gosh, they have so much planned and we hopefully will have time for questions too. Uh, so I'm the communication manager for Anza Brego Foundation. And I just wanna share a little bit about the foundation and what we do in case there's anybody on here that's not quite sure what we're doing over here, but um, we're the official nonprofit partner of Anza Brego Desert State Park. And since our inception in 1967, we provide financial support to the park. We um, help to acquire land for conservation in and around the park. And we educate the public about the park's resources. And uh, so far, we, ABF has acquired over 55,000 acres and we've provided $34 million in combined services over the past 55 years. We've been around for a while, so we've been doing this for a long time and we have a you know, really great team and great board and um, everybody works really hard. But proceeds from the photo contest go directly to support our education programs. So when you enter the photo contest and there's a little um, entry fee that does go to, to support our education. Um, so thank you so much for being a part of this and um, we love seeing all the photos every year and also um, it helps support too. So um, yeah, that's great. So I'm gonna go over a, a few little details um, before I hand it over. So let me share my screen here. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Because last time it didn't want to share. So there you go. All right. So uh, we do have sponsors that help make this happen. And of course, our partners. So Anza Borrego Desert State Park is one of our partners, along with Borrego Art Institute, who allows us to use the gallery for um, our gallery. And that happens through the month of February. And then obviously California State Parks and California Overland Desert Excursions provides the first or the best in show um, prize, which is an excursion with them, which is really awesome. If you ever, ever have, if you have not been on an excursion with them, I highly recommend them. They're amazing. And uh, I'll introduce tonight's host. So Sandy is a professional photographer. She's an accomplished speaker, instructor, photography judge, and hands-on nature photography workshop leader. She specializes in North American wildlife. She promotes ethical practices in the field of conservation photography and donates her talents towards land acquisition for better connectivity and wildlife sustainability. She invests herself in student success. Patience truly is a virtue and, and Sandy practices that mantra by listening to participant needs so she can best deliver solutions for student understanding and achievement. And our other judge tonight that will be conducting this class is Roger Guzman. And he's from South San Diego native who has a passion for the outdoors and photography since the age of 15. He has traveled and photographed throughout the Southwest. Still his favorite subject is near his home, the Anta Borrego Desert State Park, which he has been photographing for the last 30 plus years. And uh, this year's judges have changed a little bit. So you might recognize a couple of these names. We have Sandy and Roger and we have Kay Levy. And then we have Garrett Wood who has been a strong contender in the, the past few contests, but this year he's gonna be a judge and also Tom Hogan. So it's exciting to have some new judges. And we do have a uh, change in categories as well. So we have uh, six categories. We have plants, people, landscapes, animals, black and white, and we've added nightscapes. So all you night photographers out there, we now have a category just for you. We are so excited to see what you all turn in. I love seeing, one of my favorite pictures are of the night sky and um, I, I really pushed this category hard and luckily the judges all agreed. Now, you can now enter your cell phone photos into any of these categories. So we don't have a separate cell phone category anymore. And um, you can just enter them into any category you'd like. And uh, a quick rundown of the contest date. So November 1st is when we start accepting submissions. Uh, December 7th is the deadline. December 20th is when we start uh, accepting the second round, 
the prints. January 13th is the deadline for the second round submissions and also the deadline for Watts printing. January 28th is final judging. January 30th is when the winners are notified. And then February 4th is the judges critique and gallery opening. And so tonight, if you, we, we are gonna try and get to as many questions as we can. We will be limited on time. So hopefully we can get them all answered. But there's a little Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. So just type your questions into, the, into that box and um, I will do my best to keep up with them and hopefully we'll be able to get through all of them. We'll also give an opportunity at the end to ask any questions as well, but um, go ahead and type them in the question and answer box when you have them and I will try to manage them as best as I can. And so that's all I have. If you wanna visit what we're doing, our website is theabf.org. And I will hand this over. I'm not able to uh, share my screen. Okay. Let's see. Okay, see if you can do it now. Okay. Yep, there we go. Thanks. So hi, everybody. I'm going to start out here. And um, it's actually going to be me and Roger talking for the next uh, maybe 75 minutes or 90 minutes, somewhere close to that anyway. Um, it's this, this uh, webinar is for everybody, actually. There's so much um, to learn. I'm going to go over some, uh, some Photography 101 um, uh, slides and some ways to edit and things like that. Roger's going to get a little bit deeper into showing you how to edit. Um, and some of the tools in Lightroom. So it's gonna really be good whether you are a seasoned photographer or not, just beginning. Um, I think it's it's uh, gonna be time well spent if you're planning on um, improving your photography or even entering the contest. And we hope you all do. So the first thing I'm gonna start with is, um, oh, I wanted to say hi to our new judges, Tom and Garrett. Um, welcome and uh, we're glad to have you. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is editing. Uh, this is some a place that people have a lot of problems. Uh, if you're not quite sure uh, how to edit, I'm going to go through a little bit of process here with you. So for instance, um, you can see a page of, well, I don't know, maybe 50 images there of the same bird, the same mockingbird on the same little bush. And, um, you know, that's a lot of pictures to take of a mockingbird. Not really. If you're a bird photographer, you take probably more than that. This is just a clip of what I took. I probably took over 100. Um, but judging has a very, um, very specific duty. I mean, editing has a very specific duty. And that is to select the best image out of all those images that you took of that mockingbird, say for instance. What you don't want to do is you don't want to include your emotions in the judging process. So you really want to go through those images one by one, look at the details very closely and edit out the top few maybe that you think will be um, worthy of a prize or, a, you know, a place in the competition. So what I did was I went through and I found three separate uh, mockingbird images that I thought I liked best uh, for different reasons. So I'm going to kind of uh, flip through there and show you each one individually and tell you how I've decided on it and show you that I'm um, paying attention to detail in these images. So here's the first one. And I really like this image. I think it was a good image. It was better to have the, the little um, fruit in the bird's mouth uh, than not. I thought it added more to the image. Uh, and there's a little bit more of a close up of that bird with the fruit in its mouth. So that's what I'm kind of concentrating on right there. I like the way the bird's uh, positioned. <clears throat> Here's another one. And if you saw it, I just flipped it to second, my second choice. And unfortunately, this one, I don't like the eye. That nictating membrane is coming across the eye and covers up that really clear, crystal clear eye. So I'm definitely not going to use that one. But that's what this is all about, getting down to the nitty gritty 
letting your leaving your emotions at the door and figuring out what image you like best for the qualities. And so here, this one is the one I actually am choosing to work on. Um, and that's because the eye is bright, the bird's head is up a little bit. It's like almost offering you that little um, fruit. And so this is the one I'm gonna choose to work on. So there it is, I've got it on my, um, uh, you know, my uh, desktop and um, I've cropped it to where I, I like the crop a little bit better, maybe a little tight on the upper right hand side now that I look at it. Um, I probably wanna have the bird's eye down in the rule of thirds intersecting line. And I'll go through that in just a minute. Um, but anyway, so I've cropped it and I've made this image of it. And so this is the image I would show in a gallery um, or, or I would enter into the competition, except I'm wondering now if that brown line on the left-hand side is uh, too distracting. Now that probably was a palm tree in the background that I just kind of clipped there's really nothing I can do about it except maybe do uh, a little bit of work in Photoshop to get rid of that. Or I have another choice. I could um, crop it as a vertical image. And um, and this, you may like it, you may not like it. You know, you, this is all subjective. So you're certainly welcome to disagree with me, but I'm just showing you some of the process I go through. Uh, to edit images. Here's a landscape image that I, um, this is a cell phone shot, um, multiple cell phone shots. And I picked these three out because uh, I'm not sure which one I like best or which one I could work with best. Let me just show you number 1599 there. Um, unfortunately, I don't like this one. Uh, I have, if you can see my cursor down at the bottom, I have this really big, oops, that's not what I meant to do, really big white uh, um, uh uh, white uh, or sunlight coming on the sand in the front. And I don't like that at all. And I've got a, a person up here in the left hand or, or down in the left hand corner. Um, and I don't like having a person in my picture either. So let's go on to the next one. So let's see what I did a little bit differently. So I just raised my camera a little bit. The person's still there, but I got rid of that foreground that I was not happy with. Um, and that's the uh, value of shooting more than one image when you're in the field. So, it, you know, at least shoot three or four images, even if you're using a cell phone, um, you know, just to make sure that you, you know, maybe a different rendition, uh, lift your camera up a little bit, you know, just look at your edges. I'm going to tell you, look at the edges while you have your camera uh, on your scene. Make sure that there's no distracting edges like that big white um, uh, ray of sun that came down before. And now I have a third image. I backed off a little bit. This is not a great image. I would not enter this in a competition, but it just happened to be what I had to show you guys tonight. Um, so what I did with this image, uh, you can't see the person in it. I backed off a little bit. I've shown a little more of the foreground. Uh, actually, I, I like the fact that um, I'm gonna try to use my annotate tool here and see if I can uh, draw what I'm talking about here. So I, I almost think that this little uh, pile of bushes is a leading line and actually this uh, kind of a, I guess it was a roadway or it, I know the road's off to the side, but you kind of have your, uh, your eye is kind of leading into the scene. So we'll talk about leading lines here in just a little bit. But um, so what I ended up with was I ended up with um, this image. I cropped it a little bit from the top, a little bit from the bottom, and um, I think it makes a pleasing image. Now, I would go in and do a lot more enhancing on this image if I was going to use it. But for me, like I said, it was a quick image with a cell phone. And um, so uh, let's see. Let's go on to the next one, though. So this is a different type of, um, you know, I took all of those at the same time, those landscapes at the same time. Here, I've got a bunch of images that I've taken over, you know, maybe a week out in the desert somewhere. And um, and I know there's not burrowing owls in, actually in Anzaburgo Desert, but I wanted to show you a kind of a, um, my thoughts on how to edit through an animal image like this. So if you look at the very first um, uh, image here, this burrowing owl, oh, I've cut off the feet. 
And I'm totally not happy with that. So uh, this image here, the second one, I don't like the eyes of the burrowing now. I don't mind the background so much, but there's really no color. So it's not very, I mean, it's just an Im image of a burrowing owl. Um, the third image here, I decided that, um, uh, if I can find my cursor again, I don't know why my cursor decides to go away all of a sudden. But um, the third image uh, is, the background is cut off. It's like green above the top part of the burrowing owl, and then it's brown behind it. I don't really care for that image. Uh, the one at the top right, I do like that image. Um, I do like the fact that um, you can see um, the burrowing owl's eyes and you've got a story here now. You're starting to formulate a story where these artificial burrows have been put in the ground um, and this owl has adopted one of those uh, burrows. This image over to the left, of course, the owl is out of the burrow. Um, you know, I don't like that. Uh, the next three images, I've got a little owl that's um, fluffing his feathers. And all of those images are okay, but the heart, the light is really harsh on this owl. And I didn't think his eyes, which are, if you think about it, the most important part of your wildlife subject, they're not real piercing or intense. So I'm going to rule out those also. The image on the bottom left, I've got two owls. Ooh, that's good. I like that. Two owls in a scene. That's much better. Um, so I might consider that one. The next one, I've corrected the background. I've got a nice blue background. Would I have liked a nice sunset or sunrise background? Well, yeah, sure. But I, these are just, you know, some things that you got to get out in the field early or late. Um, and then the the second one to the uh, on the bottom to the uh, from the right is one with the owl with his mouth open, and I really enjoy that one. There's a few things I I'm not crazy about, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the last one, I actually missed my focus. So if you've missed your focus on an image, you might as well just put it away for later. Maybe there'll be some software that'll fix all that later on. I doubt it, but um, you cannot uh, you cannot show us a picture that's out of focus. Judges will not let those go. So um, anyway, uh, so you can see I've picked these two images to work with, and I'm I'm thinking which one will I enter? Which one do I think is best? So let's look at each individually. Um, this image here. Uh, although I love the fact that I have two burrowing owls in the scene, I have them both looking at me. Now, for me, that says I have disturbed whatever they were doing. They turned their heads to look at me, and uh, I'm not happy about that. Uh, even though he has like a little um, a bug in his mouth, uh, that would be wonderful to have. But I'm going to pass on this one because I just... I'm not, the balance isn't right. Um, uh, I just don't, you know, if they were interacting, boy, I'd have a winner, but they're not, they're looking at me and I never did get them interacting. So I'm going to stick with this image. Um, so I'm going to look at this one a little bit more in more detail and, and critical. Um, I noticed that the bottom is uh, slanted. It's not really kind of uh, horizontal. Does that bother me? Well, it bothers me. It may not bother you because you can really can't tell the, if the horizon's horizontal or not. But I think the it to me, it feels like it's leaning to the left a little bit. So I went in and did a little bit of post-processing and came up with this image. So I straightened the bottom. I highlighted, I brought some detail out of the face and the eyes. And um, I think that would be my choice uh, to enter in a competition if I was, was if I was to do so. Here's another um, one over at Indian Head uh, from close to the visitor center. And um, of all these images, uh, it was beautiful, just beautiful. But I chose this one uh, for reasons you might say, yeah, this one's the better one. I've got more of the mountain in there, Indian heads off to the right. I've got, I've, yeah, I've placed the uh, rainbow in the middle, 
um, or almost in the middle, but I still like the whole look of it. I like the fact that the um, the clouds are darkened, have darkened, and that shaft of light is coming across. So you look for those kind of things. You're really looking for light in images. This one was not taken in Anza Borrego, but I really liked how this one turned out. This was a series of four cell phone shots. And if you can just look at them, I think the upper left-hand corner is the one I picked. And I picked it for a reason because I knew what I could do in post-processing. For those of you that know how to uh, work in Photoshop or Lightroom, or even this was a cell phone, these were four cell phone shots. And I, I created this in my cell phone. I used Snapseed to create this image right there, added some uh, contrast. Um, I put, I made the darker areas darker. So there's those trees pop off the page. That's just a quick example of what I did there. So let's go over a few guidelines as to really what makes a great image. And, um, you know, seasoned photographers will know these guidelines, but it's always a good review. So exposure, is the number one thing that you have to get right. Again, if you're entering into any competition, if your exposure is not right, if that shutter speed, ISO and aperture don't come together to give you the correct exposure, you need to work on that. Um, so that's number one. So if an image comes in too light or too dark, um, we will flag it. Now, let me just say this, uh, you may have great exposure on your monitor uh, and it looks great. And then you send it into a printer and it comes back to dark and then you send it to us and then we're going to eliminate it most likely. So I'm just saying, I'm giving you some little tips. It could, it could look great on your monitor, but you got to watch who's printing your images. If you think it doesn't match your monitor, go back to that printer and get it redone. So don't wait to the last minute to do something like that. We Sometimes we let images go through the first round because we want to see how they print. It, they have potential. We say, oh my gosh, I hope this one prints good. You guys go get it printed. And then we look at it and we decide whether, oh, that's an improvement in the image or no, that's really, it just didn't work. And then we, you know, then we'll kick it out at the second round. So, so anyway, those are great. So exposure is number one. Um, the value of light. So there's three things that I think make, uh, for me, when I'm shooting wildlife, make up the best um, combination when you're, when you're shooting is light and where it's coming from. So I want you to be very conscious of where your light is coming from when you're out in the field shooting. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And then um, uh, the uh, composition has to be spot on and your, um, your backgrounds. I really, really like those nice clean backgrounds like you see in the image on, of the mockingbird on the right there. But these light values, I, you probably never even thought of this, but there's front light, flat light, harsh light, backlight, rim light, silhouette light, there's overcast lighting, there's a soft lighting palette, there's open shade, there's side light, directional light, available light, flashlight, and bounced light. I mean, and there's probably more that I had didn't think of. So if you can just look at your scene or your subject and say, what kind of light is that? And how do I want to use it best? You'll be ahead of the game right there. So let me show you a couple of examples. The one on the left is um, open shade, open shade under a oak tree. This agave was growing. And so I have very even light over that whole entire scene. Um, you know, it's up to you. You've got you've to see what works best for your subject. Um, directional light. So this is one of the most dramatic types of light, I feel. Uh, this was um, looking over the San Ysidro Mountains one day, and this light was coming through. It was just spectacular. Uh, so a directional light is very, very um, appealing to, to judges, if it's used correctly. Um, 
rim light or backlight, this is just an example. This was not taken in Anza Borrego, but it still um, shows uh, the rim around my, the owls, the great horned owls. There's that nice rim lighting around there that kind of um, kind of frames the owls. My background's nice and clean, or at least it's not cluttered. There's some modeled um, a bouquet in the background. And uh, so this one is a, a very, one of my very popular prints. So uh, let's see here. So the next one I was talking about uh, composition. So we, um, you might all know the rule of thirds, when to use it, when to break it. Um, it's just up to you. That image on the right is taken at uh, the Botanic Garden in the, uh, Encinitas. And um, you can see I've got lines drawn on that image, yellow lines. And where those arrows are pointing are the intersecting lines uh, that are that are most appealing to the viewer and, and to judges also. And so I put my gazebo in one of those lines there to kind of, it balances out the whole scene and it makes it, uh, it kind of draws your attention to that gazebo. Now, the other image on the left, this was, uh, this one's a little cluttered, uh, but I used a really um, shallow depth of field to bring out that bag. These are Betsy in, in, um, in Borrego, Betsy's uh, grape vines over at the gardens. And uh, so she's protecting those grapes from birds. And so I took a picture of that bag that has grapes in it, which you would never know unless I told you that story, probably. <laughs> so. Um, so anyway, so that I put that in the center of the frame. My point was that is in the center. We say don't center your subjects, but I'll tell you what, Roger's going to show you a subject that's centered that looks absolutely gorgeous. So there's always a time to break that rule of thirds. In composition, you have many, many choices of how to uh, add to the story, add to the composition. And one of them is leading lines. Um, and uh, although the image on the left of uh, Texas Dip would not be allowed, I don't think it would be allowed in because it's man-made and um, I, it wouldn't be allowed in the competition. But for for a very poignant um, example of a leading line, I put that image in so you could see it. Um, uh, so leading lines are part of composition, patterns and symmetry. So you can see the image in the middle has a cactus and a cactus and a rock, the same kind of pattern. And it's another smaller rock, that same kind of pattern. It, it kind of um, kind of works for that image. Uh, there's um, also on the left, there's lots of negative space in the image of the road, uh, which allows um, the viewer's eye to kind of rest and not have to look all over the frame. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. So uh, it's just another compositional tool that you might think about using. And then balance, you know, try to balance your image, uh, you know, when, you, uh, when you're taking it. Uh, framing is a great tool when you're composing an image and Indian head here is underneath the, um, I don't know if that was a Palo Verde tree or anything at the visitor center, but the view of Indian Head is framed by that tree. Um, shapes, you can see in that Ocotillo uh, that the um, little petals are repeated shapes throughout. Again, in the image on the right, far right, those shapes are repeated, um, which makes it kind of fun. Uh, color. So complementary colors in a composition are great to use. And textures, uh, the image on the right, definitely um, the te you can feel the textures in there. And I would suggest getting out a color wheel, having it somewhere on your desktop or maybe on your, you know, somewhere to take a look at and get used to like blue and yellow and what, what, uh, what colors are complementary to each other. Um, and then the third thing I mentioned was backgrounds. And I think backgrounds are just um, uh, just as important as subjects um, in most images, I would say. Uh, so on the left, you see that um, uh, flower with a dark, dark background. So I just placed that flower uh, in front of a shadowed area on the ground. 
uh, that was being shattered by, I don't know, a rock or whatever it was before I took that picture. So I, I'm, I purposely did that so I could get a dark background and a clean background so that flower would pop kind of off the page. Same thing with the coyote. Um, you can acquire those creamy backgrounds by using um, a large lenses uh, compressed so that the backgrounds just go out of focus. Make sure you ensure um, your subject. Let's see. My let me just sign on here again on my microphone said it wasn't, uh, let's see. You can still hear me, right, Jamie? I can still hear yeah. you. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, good. you're good. Yeah, I had a little notice on my screen. Uh, so anyway, so um, use your, um, use a, a wide open, uh, um, uh, aperture to get those backgrounds uh, out of focus. Uh, also, uh, if you're having trouble with even a wide open back, uh, wide open like f4 or f2.8 or something, uh, get your subject away from the background. So just have that background further away from your subject, and you'll still get those kind of creamy backgrounds. Like for instance, or point to the sky, like the image on the right hand side. You know, I instead of pointing down to the ground where I get more detail in the background, I kind of pointed to the sky on that one. So, uh, so anyway, those are uh, some tricks that you can get some better backgrounds. The next thing you want to make sure, I, this is a lot, but I mean, you know, there's a lot to photography. It's just not snapshots anymore. Uh, the competition's too fierce out there. But try to tell a story with your image. Uh, you know, capture the mood that you're seeing uh, or the emotion that you think is happening there. If it's if it's pulling on your heartstrings, it probably will pull on a viewer's heartstrings, right? So the image on the right is two bighorn sheep, um, a ewe and a lamb that are just approaching each other. Actually, it's the lamb approaching the um, the ewe, and you can tell that because the lamb's got its little foot up in the air. You kind of uh, it, it's. it's subconsciously you know that i can tell you that was what was happening that was not taken in borrego it was taken in badlands national park because i've never got great images of of uh, bighorn in borrego yet i don't get out there enough anyway so one of these days uh the image on the left it was taken in borrego it was taken at uh, club circle uh, a few years ago when um, I watched an owl family uh, grow up. And so these were little fluffy white balls when I first started them. But I do like this image um, because it kind of gives a, a, a sense of place uh, where they made their nest. Um, you know, and just keep these images simple. If you, it, the less you have to integrate an image um, and the, the better the story will be. I think that's kind of my motto on that. Okay, so there's lots of tools out there. I know I'm talking about uh, some photography 101 tips, but every every image that comes out of a digital camera needs some kind of post-processing or manipulation. If you just can't get away with it anymore, they come out of your camera pretty much flat and you need to at least give them a little bit of contrast or what they call an S curve. Um, and most of these programs will do this for you. Uh, so you, you have free programs in your on your Macs, on your window machines. Uh, this in fan view or Irfan View, I don't know how you really say it. It's a new one. I, when I was doing my research, I saw this one and I thought, well, that's kind of a neat uh, a program to use. It's free, so why wouldn't people use it? And if you, you know, if you want, take a screenshot of this page because I've given you all the uh, the links to all these um, these viewers, these um, saw the software. Uh, Adobe Photoshop Express and Snapseed are both iPad and iPhone um, uh, applications. But what's to say that you don't take your DSLR, go out there, get the great picture you think, bring it into your phone, manipulate it on your phone. It's free. These are free things. Instead of 
you know, paying for a subscription or something. Um, and then export it back out to your desktop to print it or whatever you need to do. Uh, um, uh, Photopia or uh, Photopia. I don't know exactly how to pronounce that one either, but I know that it's been used a lot by members of my photo club. Um, they love it. It's almost like a Photoshop um, uh, program. You, you know, some of these free ones will not have all the um, additions or the um, the functions that a regular Photoshop um, or Lightroom uh, paid subscription will have, of course. Uh, GIMP. GIMP is a really good one. I hear lots of great things about. And of course, the editing tools on your smartphone. If you're if you're using it for um, for taking your images, then uh, you've got a whole host of editing tools there on your smartphone. Um, the paid post-processing software. We all know about Lightroom, Photoshop, but there's some third-party uh, software that really make your job easier if you don't have time to learn uh, Photoshop, and that's Skylum or Topaz or the Nick Collection or Capture One. Um, you know, Roger and I talked about some of these that are available. They are a little bit of money, but usually they're not that much. And both Roger and I think that $9.99 a month for uh, Photoshop and Lightroom is just a steal because you just have so much at your fingertips that um, it's worth it to us. Now, there's some personal instruction that you uh, for from a couple of people in the San Diego area. So if you're from this area, um, John Watts, who does who offers the printing portion um, of our uh, photo contest you can use him or not but he has some uh, great free um, he's got us on his website it's free stuff the tab says free stuff check it out he's got so much there that you can learn from uh, Larry Vogel a friend of mine also, and he does some great, um, uh, very affordable workshops for like masking or, um, uh, you know, luminance or whatever you want, whatever you want, Larry can teach you. He's a Photoshop master also. So, um, you know, I recommend, uh, you know, using somebody like that. Uh, Larry has a, a free, uh, it, free or maybe a donation based um, like Photoshop on the fly where you bring your images, send your images to him and he'll critique your images and uh, go over how he manipulates them and how what he would suggest that you do. So all of these things are available. John Watts does the same thing when he does your printing. So um, just highly recommend those guys. They've been friends for years and uh, and they don't charge you an arm and a leg. So so I think uh, Jamie went over the categories already, um, but I think what we, we want to tell everybody is the contest um, images that you come up with need to highlight the unique and natural beauty of the desert. So, um, you know, you, you need to stay within Anza Borrego Desert State Park uh, to create your images. But, you know, again, there's the categories, plants, landscapes, animals, black and white, people enjoying uh, nature there in the desert st uh, state park, and the night, the new one, nightscapes. Um, and I think Jamie also mentioned that all smartphone images now will go into each or the appropriate category. There is no cell phone category any longer. Um, it just the, um, hmm. the cell phone images are getting so much better that the judges can't tell them apart from a regular cell phone image or a, a DSLR half the time. So we are eliminating that um, image of uh, that uh, category. But what we are looking for, and this is exactly what we um, score on the second round of, of judging is the impact your image is making or the wow factor. Okay, so if you can like make us go, wow, we wish we had that one. That's what you're striving for. And again, that you, using those tools like um, the lighting and, and uh, you know, um, clean backgrounds and all that kind of stuff that I talked about earlier. Make sure, like I said, focus and sharpness is where it needs to be. So every animal, unless you're specifically targeting a tail of an animal or something away from the eyes that you want our attention to be drawn to. Um, your focus and sharpness should be on the eyes of, of a, an animal subject. Um, 
but that's not always the case in every scene. But if you want us to look at that animal, it's going to be the eyes that we focus on. Um, composition, again, I've already um, talked about that to death. Uh, just make sure it feels balanced to you. Uh, and um, watch your horizons, because a lot of people turn in things where the horizon's crooked and out it will go. It's not going to be acceptable. Another thing you want to make sure you do, uh, the first thing I do when I pull an image in to edit, uh, I make sure there's no dust spots in the image. Um, I clean up that image as best I can. So if I see dust spots in the sky of an image of a beautiful scene, I'm going to I'm going to suggest it gets passed out of the competition. So make sure you, uh, you know, take a look at the details again. Uh, if you can be original or creative, I've seen um, a lot of people be very creative. Well, you'll see here in a little bit, I'll, I'm going to show you a couple of my favorite winning images later here. Um, and then get the exposure right. We've talked about that. So the rules for the contest uh, are pretty much the same as they were, they were last year. So if you, uh, I suggest you read the rules carefully, um, avoid including, and let me tell you, these get thrown out every single year, any logos or signatures or identifying marks uh, on your image. They will not be judged by the judges. Jamie will catch them and they'll be thrown out before we ever see them. Uh, make sure that you don't have any dogs on trails or off leash. Those will get thrown out. Um, the statues, the metal statues, oh, are not part of Anza Borrego Desert State Park. So don't include those in your images as much as you'd like to. But I know like for night scenes and stuff, don't, I'm telling you now, don't put them in there. Uh, don't include any non-native species. Uh, and make sure you don't photograph, or maybe you can photograph, but don't enter any activities that, um, you know, violate park regulations. So, and don't um, cause any distress to your animals or plants. No double exposures or composited images are allowed. Um, but however, there are no restrictions on HDR or focus stacking images. So those are okay. You can photo edit to your heart's content. Um, I suggest you uh, don't make it too crazy, but I mean, have fun with it. Uh, you know, we will, uh, we've had images that are, you know, taken into topaz and made look like uh, oils uh, or something like that, watercolors or something. And they have made it through the, through the competition. So um, the only thing with photo editing is, like double exposure and composites that isn't allowed but other photo editing is allowed and if you have any questions contact jamie at jamie at the abf.org <laughs> there you go jamie i get, i threw your name under the bus there <laughs> um and to review just what i just went over uh and because you're going to want to see what roger has to say next um uh use uh you know, people don't use cropping enough. Use cropping to compose your images. If you don't get it right, if you don't quite get the balance in your full frame image, then crop a little bit. And don't make the judges look for the image or the story that you're trying to tell us. Um, we'll, we're just gonna pass it by. Uh, so, you know, just, just make that really clear to us. Shoot early, late for best conditions, for, for color in the sky, for wildlife, uh, you know, that is out and about. You might uh, consider visiting a, a location multiple times before you decide on that images, uh, that location's image that you want to enter. Uh, review the past winners. I think that's really, really a motivational tool. And these are five of our past winners in one capacity or another. It could have been an HM or a a place, but all of those, I love each and every one of these images for a different reason. They were all in different categories. So please um, review the past winners, uh, but don't copy them because we'll know, because we know what we voted on last year. And so um, we, unless it really trumps what was happening uh, from last year, we probably won't let it through. Um, 
you know, be aware of your surroundings. Again, your light, your composition, know the rules, when to break them, leave your emotions at home when you are editing and never stop learning. And I highly recommend you come to the judges critique when this, uh, when this um, competition is over and see what uh, the judges had to say. And I believe with that, that is all I'm going to share today. So I'm gonna sh stop my sharing and Roger's gonna take over from here. So I hope okay. I didn't bore anybody. Well, actually we've got a few questions. So oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think we should get through a couple of these because they're specific to what you were talking about. Okay. Um, so Chris asks, can you give an example of what judging with emotion looks like? You mentioned you don't wanna do that. Well, I, I think people are misunderstanding. Um, we want emotion in the photograph, of course. I think it's leaving your emotions uh, at home, meaning your attachment to a, a certain photo maybe because of the time and place. Uh, you know, there might've been a beautiful rainbow. It was a 10 mile hike you had, you know, you, you took a 10 mile hike. It was a beautiful day, um, beautiful evening or whatever. But then the photos really, might not have came out like that really would show uh, to another viewer that 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 enjoyment that you had that day. So you have to kind of take yourself out of the context of what you were feeling at that time and really look at that photo uh, for what it would uh, what it would do for a viewer, what kind of emotions it would create for the viewer. And, and I've done this plenty of times. I've you know hiked out to a spot. Um, had a, you know, like an awesome experience and then came back home with nothing that really resonated with me. Um, and you have to just say, you know, God, but I, you know, I went through so much to get there. I did so, you know, it was so beautiful and all that. But then in the end, I didn't come back with anything. You know, I came back with great memories, but as far as, you know, photography, uh, might not have came back with something that really is going to work to uh, a third party viewer because that person was not there. They did not experience that. So um, I think that's what we talk about in emotion, uh, you know, let go of, uh, you know, your attachment to the photos of, you know, whatever happened on that day or whatever, um, you have to kind of let that go and look at the photo for in itself as a kind of an objective third party. You, you know, you don't want to, uh, yeah, like, oh boy, I really, I just, you know, like I, I just went there and it was just so hard to get there. And, 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 and just sometimes we come back empty handed. And the great thing about that is, um, well, you go back and, yeah. and you play again, you know, and that, that's the fun part of it. So. Yeah. Think, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Roger. Yeah. Um, okay, so Joan's asking, she says, I have problems with my Samsung cell photos. I lose focus when I crop and zoom. Any hope? You refocus when you crop? She, lo she loses focus. Oh, it loses focus. Uh, that's interesting. I don't know. That may be something wrong with your specific camera. But I will say that, um, or your cell phone um, app, uh, I will say that, uh, if you're using a cell phone or a smartphone that gives you like uh, my 13 Pro Max gives me a 0.5 and a one times and a three times, uh, those, if you're using those three settings, they are opti optimal zoom or optical zoom. If you change between any of those settings, you're getting digital zoom. And that will affect how your image comes out. Now, I don't think that's answering your question completely. Roger, do you have anything else to add to that? I think it No, I think you get kind of like a pixelation when you do use digital zoom. Um, yeah. It's not as crisp. It's not as nice. Uh, right. But yeah, it depends. And it also depends on, you know, I'm not real. I, I don't use cell phones that much as far as cameras wise, um, but uh, sometimes they do have a hard time focusing, staying focused on an area, you know, you got to put your finger where you want it. And I, you know, even with my own cell phone camera, I've had it where it just does not, you know, maybe because it's too low a light or, um, you know, there's not, a, usually they're trying to find areas of contrast and, you know, there's not enough contrast in that area for it to focus in. So yeah. Yeah. Good it, points. yeah. 
And then we've got um, Thomas is asking, do you use auto ISO? Upside is convenience and one less parameter to adjust, but what are the downsides? Um, yeah, go ahead, Roger. Uh, I don't. <laughs> you use it? Uh, I yeah. do not use auto ISO. No. I, I, I lose one of the determining factors of my exposure and I don't want to do that. I want to have all control. Yeah, same with me. I don't use auto expo. Um, I, it, it's fine for when you're taking pictures of your kids, you're in different lighting situations, your kids running around, or you're doing maybe even some, uh, you know, street photography, things like that. And it might work out really well for that because uh, you got a lot, a lot of changing light um, situations. But I tend to, uh, ISO is a big, uh, actually a big thing, a big parameter, at least for me. Um, I want to use, I want to get away with the lowest ISO I can get away with um, because usually when you're using the lowest ISO that your camera can do, you're going to get the cleanest image, um, you know, less noise, things like that. You're going to be able to uh, open up uh, shadows better. Uh, you know, it, it can get complicated about it, but it, it's just one more uh, thing I would like to have control over. Um, so I think, especially if we're talking about landscapes or things like this in the desert, I think uh, practice using, I, you know, ISO, um, you know, dialing in, maybe, you know, it's a bright day or a brighter light then use the lowest ISO you can get away with because you're going to get the cleanest image, usually if your camera, whatever the, you know, base ISO that it's at. And then, of course, you know, when it does get a little darker um and maybe you don't have a tripod or whatever then yeah you might have to up the iso but you know recognize that situation uh, and do it yourself like because sometimes the camera is basically picking for you and it's not going to pick always what's best you know especially what you're going to get the best image you know with the least amount of noise and 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 i i just yeah i personally would not use it but you know it, it it's to each your own you could still come out with a beautiful photo if you did use I, auto iso but yeah what right, one last, oh, go ahead. <laughs> what, one last uh, quick one, if we can, because we are, we're getting close. Well, we have time, but I want Roger. I know Roger has a lot to say. Yeah. Um, what is HDR and focus stacking? What is it? Yeah, I think it was oh. on your, your, your list. Yeah, it was. So HDR is high dynamic range, HDR. And it, uh, some cameras allow you to put it in HDR mode. And that camera then will take uh, an image that is uh, exactly what the scene shows, uh, a little bit underexposed by whatever you set it to, a uh, half a stop or a third of a stop, and maybe overexpose it a third of a stop. And then the camera itself, some cameras, not all, um, will uh, combine those three images to make the best image with, uh, uh, so the lights are not blown out and the darks are not too blocked up. So you'll have a, um, a more even image uh, come out of that. Now you can do that on your own. If you set your camera a third stop or a half stop below uh, exposure and a half stop over and take three images, you can combine them in uh, Photoshop or Lightroom. Or can you do it in Lightroom, Roger? Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, you could do it in Lightroom. Okay. I don't use Lightroom, so Roger's our Lightroom expert. Um, uh, and then, uh, then focus stacking is another thing that people do. It's completely different than HDR. Um, focus stacking is where you have a subject in front of you and uh, say it's a landscape and you take a, a image of in focus about a third of the way out. You take another image uh, about halfway out focused. You're refocusing your focusing ring at that point. And then you take another one further out. And now you've got three images that are stacked that are all different focusing points in your image. This works really well when you're doing like a bug or macro photography. People take, you know, a hundred images of one little bug and they're all focused just behind the other. You're focusing ring just a little bit, a little bit. They just change it just ever so slightly. Then they stack all those together in Photoshop. You'll, you'll need a program like Photoshop that you can... Um, you can see all the layers. Not all those free programs will allow that to happen. And then you combine those. It's a, a tedious process of, and you really need to know Photoshop really well, but they st you stack them now. And now you've got a really great 
focus and detail in every aspect of that flower, that that landscape scene, that bug in front of you. So that's, you have anything to add on that, Roger? No, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, you would have to use Photoshop um, mostly to, to do that. Uh, but yeah, it's a great tool. And it's basically, it's, you're still it's a single image so we're not like we're combining a lot of the same image but it's it's the same you know it's not so much like compositing different images so it still right. counts um, but yeah that is a great tool especially when you're doing close-ups of uh plants or you know animals um you know especially people that like to do uh insects things like that that are really tiny and you have such shallow field of depth of field that you do want to you know be able to show a little bit more than just like just like one eye or something like that and focus so yeah awesome all right well, we've got a couple more questions but Janie and Chris I'm going to hold off until um after Roger just to make sure we have he has enough time um Roger just so you know right now we have 30 minutes left um, okay so I'll try to or... make it. <laughs> <laughs> so let me share my screen if I can all right um, so here I am, we're using, I'm using uh, Lightroom here, which is a part of the Adobe, uh, you know, Photoshop, Lightroom, um, part of their, they actually have a lot of different programs. Uh, it's a great program. It, it is used probably by the majority of photographers, not that there is another, there's other, other, lots of other great programs, but I would say most photographers that I know uh, use Lightroom, uh, Photoshop, combination of those, you can get it for like $9.99 a month. Um, I know I hate paying for subscriptions, but since I, I, you know, I do photography so much and they do update it every so often. So uh, it's great. It's just a great tool. Um, the, the great thing also about Lightroom is it is also a great uh, digital asset manager. And what that means is um, it, it, it does a great job of organizing your photos, your photo library. So you import things in through Photoshop. So like you put in your... Uh, your card from your you know DSLR or whatever your camera put the card into your computer um, and it will import it in and it will organize your photos all kinds of different ways you can do it by uh, you know by each year and day um, you can do it by subjects there's all kinds of great things you can make collections um, just that you know that in itself would be a whole big uh, huge uh, thing that I I don't I haven't even dived super deep into that but um, so like right now we're in the library and, and this is Lightroom. Um, over here is your navigator. This shows you know what photo that I'm clicked on right now. Um, this is uh, a quick collection. So I just made for this presentation a quick collection from all my big light, you know, my whole library. I just uh, just picked which ones I wanted in here, and then now I got this quick collection. Um, but we're going to go into the develop module. So mostly you're going to be, you know, we're talking about the library and then the develop module. You also have other modules here uh, that we, you know, you probably won't be using as much. Um, but here I have a photo, uh, a simple, just a regular kind of uh, uh, landscape photo. Um, I wouldn't call it very spectacular or anything. Uh, this, uh, but I'm going to show you, you go, we're going to go into the crop tool. So we're going to Again, we'll be uh, talking about composition. Um, if you use your crop tool here, uh, right here, you got your crop tool in uh, Lightroom. Um, you do get these lines here. And so like on this one, we got the rule of thirds. And if you press your O button, actually this is like diagonals, um, centered, triangles. This is another really great tool. I like this is the golden ratio, which is very similar to rule of thirds. I use this a lot. Um, and, and one clue that you can do also is most cameras do have the ability to show you a grid and, uh, in the camera itself, uh, depending on your DSLR or your mirrorless camera. Um, usually you can show a grid, uh, some kind of grid. And most of the time you can use this like rule of thirds grid. I have that default in my camera. So every time I'm composing, I'm already have that grid right there for me in the camera. And so, you know, trying to get the composition in the camera as close as to what you want. If you can get it before you even come, you know, go to editing and you can get it in the camera, that's the, that's great. We always want to be able to get all your exposures, everything else in the camera before you even bring it into editing. The more of that you can get down and, and then uh, when you go to edit it, the less work you're going to have to do. 
Um, but this photo in particular, we'll just go over it. it, it I would say it's okay. We're, we're following the rule of thirds kind of because we got this uh, right here. We have the Akatio right centered in here. Um, but we have a, a few things going on here. I'll use my uh, draw tool here. Um, a lot of things we do see is we got kind of some of this Akatio is pushing out of the frame and we call it like a visual pinch. Um, it's it's not, you know, like it's being cut off there and it looks kind of awkward. And so we do see a lot of things like that or maybe something coming into the frame that, you know, like another Akatio coming in or something that kind of distracts from from the, the, the whole picture itself. So I would say, you know, look at things like this, visual pinches, not that you, you know, if you came really close into the Akatio and most of it was coming out of the, you know, out of the screen or whatever, that's fine. Uh, but in this kind of situation, I wouldn't want to, you know, I, I wouldn't want this at all. So uh, watch for these type of things. Um, but to me, overall, this is still kind of a whole hum image. Um, it's okay. It's got some impact, but not not a lot. We got some clouds here. It, it looks kind of awkward to me a little bit. The blue and the clouds don't kind of really mesh together very well. Um, and so I would not, normally I would not use this image for anything. Um, and then here's another image I have. Uh, we got this, you know, these great, uh, beautiful flowers that are, you know, blooming. Um, but we have a lot of crowding going on in here. Let me even take out the, so we got so many things going on here that your eye is going all over the place. There's really, maybe the, you kind of think the flowers are the subject. Um, but I also, you know, I think uh, you have, you know, this Akatil that's being kind of cut off. There's like here again, we have a little bit of an Akatil kind of coming in into the frame. Um, and then we have all these other Akatils here. Uh, and then this big rock here that just nothing seems to mesh in this photo. So um, look for, you know, like I would say this was kind of like a snapshot that I took. Um, not really a great photo. Uh, you know, you can, you know, the exposure and all that is not too bad. Um, but overall, there's I don't feel like there's a visual impact in this. So we'll go to another one here. Um, so this one may be a little better. It's kind of, I think, you know, kind of a plain sky, but um, if we go to the crop tool here, uh, I kind of cropped it in a little bit, um, following the rule of thirds. Uh, so we got the Akatillo, you know, right here on this line, um, kind of the horizon on this line here. Um, and the, the other great thing though about like uh, Lightroom is you can go, if you go over here, uh, you can try to look at this in black and white also. So you can see the picture in black and white. You can go to color. Um, you can go back and forth a little bit uh, and see maybe it works a little better in black and white. And then also another clue in uh, in Lightroom here is you can actually um, you can go to let me go back to black and white and you can do this. You can browse uh, profiles and you can actually pick different profiles. Um, that you want your photo to be in. So we have black and white with different uh, like emphasis on the sky, um, basically emulating like here, emulating a, a green filter, emulating a, a blue filter, emulating a, a, a yellow filter. Um, so uh, you can really get in depth with this, but there are so many different uh, profiles depending on the camera too, that actually sometimes uh, Lightroom will pick up the uh, profiles that your camera manufacturer also has built into your camera. Um, but you can, yeah, definitely you can play with different profiles. Uh, I'll close this. Um, and then you also do have, uh, we'll just go real quick, you do have presets, which is kind of similar to profiles. Profiles are a little bit more advanced. They're kind of like RGB curves. Um, I won't get into it too much, but it, it, it's a, not so much playing with any of the presets or your sliders here. Profiles isn't doing anything to any of those. It's kind of like giving it like you're taking the picture like in a different type of film uh, or something like that. I guess I would best equate it to. Um, but you do have uh, presets and those are like anything that you do with the sliders here, you can actually save as a preset. If you liked what you did, you can go and add if you so you're over here on your left side you can add it as a, you can create a preset um and then all these different elements that you did 
to the the you know the photo you can save just some of the elements or whatever as a preset and create it and name it um again that would be something you and, and youtube is such a great resource too you can go into youtube and there's so many people that have so many videos into really specific aspects of uh, lightroom um but presets are great uh Photoshop, uh, not Photoshop, but Lightroom itself has lots of can presets that they have, um, like landscape presets already. And you can even watch as you go into different presets, you can watch these little sliders move. Um, and so they even have presets that you could start out with and then you can play with them yourself. You know, you can play with the exposure and all of that. If you kind of like preset, but you want to dial it in a little bit more, you can uh, do that with. Uh, with Lightroom, um, but this photo in particular really isn't still kind of not really working. I really wish there was some clouds in here. That would add a lot more. So we'll go to another photo here. Um, this one seemed to work a lot better. Um, now I have this in black and white and it's obviously been worked quite a bit, uh, but um, this one, I had the clouds, everything worked out really well. Um, what we have going on here is let's see first we'll look at it uh i think in this one i used a golden ratio like this ratio right here so i kind of lined up the ocotillo to here kind of the horizon of the mountains right here you know i can just nudge it up a little better like that so i got i've got it kind of composed this way um also, though, we have a lot of leading lines in the landscape itself. You got this kind of light and dark area right here that uh, you got these lines and, and contrast. And even in the sky itself, you have these kind of like uh, curves, like S-curves going on. And so we're kind of mirroring S-curve in the land here, mirroring an S-curve in the sky here, light and dark in the sky, you know, high contrast, same with here in the in the landscape itself. Um, and this is what we look for. We're looking for things like this that uh, you, you know, like it, it's leading the, the viewer is leaded to this Ocotillo, but also, you know, looking at these curves here and all that, your, your eye is going all over the place here, kind of, but uh, just, it, it seems to have a little bit more impact and emotion. And I think we're, that's what we're kind of looking for. So I'll clear this. Um, and then also, again, you can, look at can look at this uh in color now in color here it's kind of since i had it in black and white it's actually um the colors are kind of a little bit more saturated because when i'm doing what i'm doing in black and white is uh working with color you're actually working with colors and how the black and white is how the black and white is actually dealing with the colors um so if you go down here you can see how like I turn the blue down a little bit, the, the sky gets a little darker. So almost like adding a filter into your, you know, like on your camera lens. So you can play with greens, um, yellow, see how the yellows will come out or darken a little bit. And then especially the oranges, like, so you can play with these sliders here. So when you're in black and white mode, um, you can play with this mix right here. This is great to play with all these sliders and it tell you know it will show you how the the exposures and um how it's going to react to each of these colors almost like putting uh filters on um, um here's another one from the similar uh same same pretty much almost the same spot um this is actually near fonts point but looking away from fonts point looking towards the north so both of these were near Fonts Point, but I was like, everybody usually is photographing Fonts Point, looking to the south. I thought, well, you know what, I, I, I'm going to go try to do something a little different. I'm going to go, you know, walk along the edge of that, you know, that Badlands view and then start looking towards the north and see what I see. And on this evening, I saw, you know, like, like some great lighting um, and looking at a uh, kind of a composition that you normally wouldn't see when everybody else is, you know, photographing Fonts Point from the other direction, I, I, I thought, well, this is kind of a little bit more unique. Um, but again, we have, uh, let's see, I'll put the draw tool on. Um, I'm using elements of the landscape to, to 
use as leading line kind of lines here, like curves here. So use the, you know, you can use the landscape in itself as as lines themselves to, you know, to point the viewer out into the looking at, at the mountains, things like that. So all right, and then we'll go to the next one here. And here's uh, this one's actually in Utah, but a, a slot canyon in Utah. And this um, we do have slot canyons here in Anza Borrego, maybe not, you know, with this, you know, really red rock going on, but we do have uh, several areas with slot canyons. I know uh, near um, Canyon Sonombre, there's one, and then there is an area that actually is called Slot Canyon. Um, there's lots of slot canyons. We do see lots of great photos from the slot canyons. Um, and so this was one in, in, in Utah. Uh, you got the hiker kind of in the center here. Um, it, you know, I centered the hiker here. Uh, and, and it does even have some, I would say it has some lines going on here too. So we got these lines leading right at the, the hiker. Uh, but then we have this huge area that's really distracting you here. This big, just the sky area in here is just so bright that it's distracting so much from the photo. Um, and there's really no way to crop this out. Um, so this photo, it just didn't quite work. Um, so from that same hike, I ended up taking another one and I was kind of on the move here. And I think this one actually worked a lot better. Um, you got the hiker here, we're kind of telling a story. The hiker's going through, you know, we're hiking and, and it's looking into this nice little area right here of light into the next corridor, kind of like, you know, around the bend. Um, I, I, again, I'm trying to use leading lines uh, right here. We're using leading lines in here of the, you know, the canyon walls and the floor. Um, I've got a lot of contrast going on here, so it has been worked. Even the, you know, the rocks here, I'm trying to keep those kind of in focus. Um, this photo I did just basically on the run. Um, we were like on a 20 mile hike. And so, you know, setting up the tripod and sitting, you know, setting up a, a photo was just, it was too much. And my, uh, my friend here, she, she wasn't going to have it if I was going to set a, you know, set up a tripod and, and, you know, have her pose and all that. So I was just taking this as I was going on the run, um, you know, just making sure that my cameras, again, set your ISO. Uh, I think I, you know, set it at ISO 200, knowing uh, um, that my camera could handle 200 was still really well. That was almost like base ISO for this camera. Um, and then using the, the lens has a uh, built-in uh, stabilization. So that helped out a lot. Um, and so this photo worked well, except again, we do have this bright, bright area in here again, that's kind of distracting from it. Um, and so what I ended up doing is, this is where we're gonna bring in the crop tool. Um, and a great thing also when you, you bring in the crop tool here in uh, Lightroom is, and in most uh, programs, you can actually change the ratio of the crop. So here I decided to go with like a 4-3 ratio. Um, and that helped a little bit, but we still got a little bit of this light coming in here, this little light area. So what I did is I, you can open up, it's locked to a 4-3 ratio. I opened it up, unlocked it, and I'm gonna scooch this down just a tad bit. So we're not quite a 4-3 ratio, but pretty close. And now that it's done, now we don't have that kind of distracting light right there. We have this light here, you know, this nice kind of warm light in here, you know, inviting light, you know, going around the corner, you're gonna, the hikers is ready to go around this next corner. Um, and so this I feel kind of tells a story of you know, uh, hiking and this great area, this place of light and, and all that going on. And this is kind of like when we're in the, when we're looking at photos in the contest, this is what we're looking for, kind of a story. The, the hiker is interacting, the person is interacting with the uh, landscape, with the surroundings here. Um, not so much less like, you know, somebody I could have had her turn around, pose. Um, we wouldn't really want that. This, this person is doing exactly what we would like to see, you know, somebody doing hiking. Um, 
those photos tend to work, uh, you know, a little bit of cropping. Um, definitely a lot more work in here as far as editing, uh, but it worked out really well as opposed to say like this one, it was just, it, there was no helping it with this area in here, this bright area, there was just nothing that was gonna help it. So um, I tend to like using wide angle lenses. So a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of my photos here all have wide angle lenses. If you don't have wide angle lenses, that's great too though, actually that you can uh, get Excellent, excellent uh, photographs without wide angle lenses, but I tend to like using wide angle lenses. Um, here's one from, uh, this is Clark Dry Lake in our, uh, you know, in our park here. Um, again, I'm using leading lines. Unfortunately, these are tire tracks. Uh, we do not, it is, it, it is against the rules to drive your car on the dry lake bed. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people do. Um, so I was a little mixed about showing, you know, showing these tracks, using these tracks, but I kind of feel, well, this is part of the unfortunate, you know, uh, part of the, the landscape here. And so I'm going to use it. Um, as you see, I, I, I did use like a 4-3 crop here, align this up, this horizon right here, these mountains up with this. And even if we press the O, um, you can see too that I'm have these uh, tracks are forming kind of a diagonal also, so it kind of works in both ways. Um, and we'll put it back to here. And so using these leading lines, uh, using kind of the rule of thirds, or or it, actually this was like a, a golden ratio. Actually, that's like what I used with this. Um, and here's another clue uh, if we want to look at. I'm going to reset this and you'll see this photo does, this is the raw photo now. It looks nothing like that photo. Um, and what I'm doing here is when I take photos, I, they tend to be kind of the, the photo that's coming out of here, the raw photo is going to look kind of flat. Um, I'm exposing, knowing my camera and knowing what I can do uh, as much, you know, what, what shadows I can take out and all that. I'm exposing kind of for the shadows and kind of, exposing for the, the highlights in here. So here, these highlights look almost blown out, um, but I know knowing my camera that um, I'm gonna be able to recover some of them. And as you see right there, I can start to recover them. Um, and I'm gonna be using masks to recover these highlights. And I'm gonna be using a mask to uh, recover some of these shadows here. So let's see, we'll go back to, original photo there we are um lightroom that is a great great uh photo you know uh processing program there is a lot of things you can do with it um and at, at the end here i'll show you how to at least do a basic using some basic masks um how to get you know like at least you can you know you can expose for your highlights here and then you can have another area bringing out shadows um again another photo here of using tire tracks, unfortunately, again, but using, I love this curve here. Um, and again, you can see I, I'm using what we would call like a golden ratio here and also straightening out uh, the horizon. So originally this horizon wasn't straight. Um, originally it was kind of a little bit crooked. And so using your crop tool, you can, you can use that to kind of straighten out your horizon. And here I used a, uh, let's see, I use a 16 by nine ratio. So kind of a longer ratio here. Um, and I think that worked really well with this kind of giving you this sweeping view of uh, the dry lake bed and using texture and light um, uh, to, to just accentuate everything here on this photo. Um, here is another photo that's kind of similar. Uh, this is actually on the beach, um, but I'm using these footprints to kind of lead you know lead you into the farther reaches of this photo here, um, and then using the texture of the sand um, as elements too as lines here. And as you can see, I on this one I use more of a let's go through yeah this one was using more of a rule of thirds so I used kind of a rule of thirds prop here. Um, placing the horizon here on the on this line here. 
And so use elements of the landscape, look at textures, uh, lines, things like that. Look at, and always a bonus is having, you know, beautiful skies, clouds and all that, that, that really helps you out a lot. So if you're out on a really like uh, clear day, um, you might have a harder time getting these type of landscapes and maybe sometimes that's a better day to, you know, get in closer type uh, pictures, you know. And then here uh, I will show you, this is utilizing kind of like elements here. So we kind of have a yin and yang thing going on. Um, so you have this element, this dark element of like this shape, and then also here, a lighter element in the landscape. So they're kind of mirroring each other, kind of a yin and yang thing. So there's kind of a symmetry going on, uh, again, in the sky, a light and dark uh, thing going on here in the sky and also in the landscape, um, using a lot of contrast in this landscape to, to create this kind of yin yang uh, thing going on here. And then go to the next one. And also here now I'm I'm coming in kind of closer. I wasn't using such not so much of a telephoto lens, but kind of a medium uh, angle lens. And I'm using this is looking down from the lagunas down into the desert. Um, I'm utilizing parts of the mountain ridge here, kind of as a dark. So making this kind of dark area here, and then like an opposite light area here. And again, kind of this yin and yang thing going on here, symmetry going on. So look for things like that um, in your photos. And, and especially when you're looking in the through your viewfinder, um, I would, you know, if you have your viewfinder on, you can uh, you can look at, you know, the grid lines here and kind of match up your grid lines, kind of get myself right here. I, I was kind of like trying to get it close to like right here and knowing too later on that I could crop to like a, a, a longer uh, ratio. Like this is like a little bit longer ratio, but you could also try doing, let's see, we'll go back to the original. So the original was not quite that great because then you had this big shadow right here. Um, so I had to definitely crop out that shadow there. That was too distracting. So we'll go back to, the way it was here. And then again, if your skies aren't really working for you, um, use a, you know, if you do have a telephoto lens, use a telephoto lens. And so this was actually, this was done on film, um, but I used a kind of a telephoto lens here and just focus in, this is like near Font's point, just focused in on the Badlands, had beautiful, uh, warm light, the sun was going down, it had this beautiful warm light. There wasn't really much clouds, it was kind of hazy, but just focused in here on this texture and all this repeating pattern of the answer. So we just got this kind of repeating pattern of these, you know, these little ridges here in the badlands here, these eroded cliffs. Um, you know, I think that really worked well. So Definitely, if you're not always using wide angle, I love wide angle, but if you, you know, I need to practice more getting into, uh, if you've got a telephoto lens or medium photo, you know, even a medium angled lens, uh, you know, look at the landscape using that and not using, you know, don't always have to utilize the sky. So, Roger, so. just a heads up, we've got about five minutes left. Oh, okay. <laughs> And we have we have four questions, so five minutes and four questions. We can answer okay. the can answer those questions after. All right, so I'll just go real quick. This is what we don't want to see with flowers. Um, uh, Sandy had a great uh, picture with flowers. Uh, she, you know, had the dark background, but just a flower like this is what we don't want to see. Um, here is something I did do uh, with an agave. Uh, a lot of symmetry going on with this photo. Um, I ended up. Uh, making it, I think it worked a little better in black and white than it did in color. So here it is in color. Uh, I, I did it in black and white. I think it looks really sharp. Um, the only thing though is we still have like all these areas distracting. So got this beautiful symmetry, but you still got these distracting elements on the edges here. So what I would do is I went in and did a square crop, super tight crop here, centered it. And I think right here looks a lot better. So you don't have all these distracting elements on the side. 
Um, you have all this stem going on. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, everything I try to get as sharp as possible. So it's super sharp. Uh, and utilizing all these lines and symmetry. And uh, of course, this is in the middle. We say don't always do things in the middle, but sometimes, you know, placing things in the middle works great. Um, so I will go through and do something really quick. Um, so here's a photo that I take, uh, I've taken over in um, Clark Dry Lake. Uh, this was just from earlier this year. Um, and this one, of course, has all worked and every, it, it's been, uh, there's like a lot of masks in here. So the good thing about uh, light use what they call masks, you could do a lot of masking. Um, let's see if I can move this out of the way here. And so I have all these different masks in here. Let's see if we can show them. And you can even name them. Um, have this one, the foreground. I'm opening up the foreground. I have the uh, sky mask in here. Um, and here, what I'm doing on this mask is uh, you can play with the exposure a little bit. You can play with your highlights. You can accentuate these clouds. Um, but what I'm going to do is we'll go to the next one, just photo. Okay, so here's basically the raw photo of that photo. Um, so what you can do now in, in Lightroom is you got your basically you got your exposure slider here. Um, so you can play with your exposures. Uh, you have your contrast slider, um, your highlights. So your highlights are these bright areas here. So you can kind of bring those in a little bit, get a little bit more detail. Um, but what I'm going to show you here is you can use masks. So you can come up to here. You got this little round thing here. Um, and I'm going to just do a simple linear gradient mask. And I'm going to pull this down like this. And you can see how the mask is going to react. And it's kind of like a gradient. So more of the what's going to happen is going to happen up here. And it's going to start to just taper off as you go down. Um, and you could show the overlay right here. And I'm going to play, say, we're going to play with the exposure. So we're going to bring this in a little bit. We're going to bring the highlights in, maybe open it up a little more here. And we'll be done with that mask. Um, but now we still look like the, the foreground here is still kind of uh, like, still kind of dark. And you can play with your shadow slider and that kind of opens it up but then we what we can do is do another mask so we can create a new mask here and we'll do another linear gradient mask a real simple mask and we're going to come up from this way and kind of want most of this whole foreground here the lake bed the dry lake bed to be affected by this mask so i'm going to turn it off at least the showing of it and now we're going to bring up the exposure a little bit and the shadow. So all this is doing here is we're playing with all these sliders here, your exposure, contrast, highlight, shadows, but it's affecting the area of the mask. It's not affecting any other area of the photo. Um, so this is what's a really, really great tool in uh, Lightroom and it could get very, a lot more complicated. Again, you can look on YouTube. There's a lot of great tutorials on masks and how you can utilize them. Um, but this is just a real simple. Um, so, you know, you can open up uh, again, you can open up these. So let me look at this mask again. Let me see if I can, uh, I can even bring the blacks down a little bit. So your darks are a little bit darker. I could bring the whites out a little bit more. So the, your, your white, your lighter tones out, um, open up the shadows a little bit, uh, add a little more contrast to it. Um, and then, you know, even open it up a little more exposure. And I could see it, I'd say I can bring this up a little bit more so that it's affected more in this area. And let's see, so just enough exposure and we can even bring out a little more clarity to it, a little bit more texture. Um, so you can do all these different things. You can even change the color temperature of just that area of the mask. So I can make it a little warmer. I can change the temperature to a little bit warmer. I can make it a little cooler. You know, it's like too cool, but 
yeah so if you want that area to be a little warmer than say the rest of the photo you could do that um, you can even play with the tinting a little too you know a little too magenta -y or you can go towards a little green um, but masks are great you can get lost in masks uh, but they are such a great tool in Lightroom um, uh, some of the freeware programs will have I think simple masks but uh, usually you would have to pay a little bit more to, you know, going to have to pay for something like Lightroom, Photoshop, or like even maybe like Capture One um, to get the ability to do this. But these are definitely when you want to bring your uh, photography up to the next level, these, this, these uh, using masks is a great, great tool. Um, and we'll go into one more thing. And I, I, one thing that we do notice a lot of people do um, when they do do their photos is sharpening. Uh, so just about any photo editing problem program is going to have a sharpening tool. Um, and I always say don't over sharpen. So here's, here's just uh, basically zero sharpening. Um, I like to do just a little bit to start with. And you have, so you have the amount of sharpening, you have the radius, which is how many pixels, basically the radius of sharpening, the detail, how much detail it's going to sharpen. And then this this right here is masking. And it, what it's doing is saying, um, I'm not going to sharpen like noise. Uh, so the more you mask, the, the more you're telling the, the program, I just want basically detail and, and lines like uh, edges to be sharpened, not noise. Um, what happens is we see a lot of people, they over sharpen. So they, you know, they put the radius as much as possible. They go to as much detail as possible probably not using masking and then looks like mosaic. So I don't know if you can see this, but it looks like kind of like a, you get this kind of texture and mosaic going on and it's over sharpening. Um, I'll zoom into like 200% and here in this navigator here, you can zoom in. Um, and what happens is you get this really ugly mosaic. And then also when you over sharpen, you get kind of this white line along the edge, there's this halo going on. Um, so I say when you're sharpening, when you're using the sharpening tool, uh, use it sparingly, just enough. You know, we want, we definitely, we are looking to make sure things are sharp. Um, and you want to get things sharp, you know, out of the camera as sharp as possible before you even bring it into post-processing. Um, so, you know, make sure that everything is as sharp here. Here in the distance, I, I like to have it kind of sharp and not too sharp when I'm doing landscapes. The distance is kind of like, if this was too sharp, I think it looks too unnatural. You kind of do want it to be a little bit more diffused. Um, and the things that you do want sharper are your foregrounds, the area that is in the foreground. So you still want the kind of that feeling of um, sharpness all the way through, but the distance areas, you don't want over sharp. You don't want to overdo it. And um, so I always say play with the sharpening a little bit, but don't don't over sharpen. Sharpen what you need to be sharpened. Uh, again, this is a, another tool that you could you know I could do a whole uh, lesson in um, just doing uh, how, how to sharpen. And then you also in Photoshop or even in Lightroom utilizing your uh, masks, you can just sharpen certain areas and other areas you you cannot sharpen. And I what I tend to do in uh, Lightroom also is I actually de-sharpen some areas. Uh, as as say your distant areas, I don't want them as sharp as the the foreground areas. So I do kind of do a little bit more de sharpening. So it gives you that more of a three D perspective, like that your distance do look like your distant areas look like they're more in the distance. So um, so like on this photo here, I did uh, you know the distance areas aren't quite as sharp here. I actually even kind of up these little highlights here with the lighting coming in here. I kind of accentuated those. I brought out, um, there was a little bit of shadows in here. So I brought up these shadows, um, you know, and then I also just played with the sky, uh, making sure that, you know, the sky is kind of dramatic. And, and um, but uh, again, this would be, uh, yeah, definitely. I don't think we have time to go into this, but yeah, there's so much that you can do with uh, Lightroom. So how much time do we have left? We're at, we're six minutes over right now. Okay, so if we have any questions, um, I guess it would be the time to take any questions. Yeah, we've got a few. So um, 
Chris is asking, and I had a comment earlier, kind of similar to this, but uh, it says, for this contest, since the second round of judging is based on prints, do you have recommendations on how to approach that process? I see that Lightroom has a print module. Curious if you recommend that option. And that goes along with the earlier comment, wondering why we don't do prints for the first round. So maybe you could address that, both those questions. Yeah. Um... So yeah, printing is a, it definitely Lightroom does have a print module, um, and that's more of for your uh, printing to your own printer. Um, uh, what we would try to do though is if you're going to have a third party printing printed, um, you're going to probably it, 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 you're going to be getting a little bit into color space, so you're going to ask your printer what color space they're going to want the print to be in, um, and uh, Usually there are different color spaces, another lesson probably, but uh, most people when they are, when they uh, post something to web, it's in sRGB color space, which is kind of a more limited color space. Um, when we print, we usually print in Adobe RGB or um, uh, like something like Pro Photo color space. Uh, but yeah, printing, I do a lot of printing. Um, when you're printing it you're basically going to be trying to calibrate your monitor so you're going to have like a, my monitor is calibrated to my printer um, i actually have several different calibrations to my monitor i have one that is calibrated to how things are going to look to the web and then i have a calibration that is how things are going to look on my uh on my printer um even depending on my you know different printer so you're going to be most things on the monitor are going to end up printing a lot darker in prints, no matter what, you, whether your own printer or to a printer. So you might have to approach it in thinking that you're going to make a file that's going to be maybe slightly lighter than what you're going to see, you know, like that, what you're um, displaying for the web and what you're printing is going to be the two files are probably going to look a little bit different um, and you're going to optimize for printing. Um, but definitely ask the printer, whoever you're printing to, what color space they want. They, they will even print, I know they will still print in sRGB, but if you do have a wider gamut color space, um, you know, if you can export that photo into that wider gamut color space, that'd be even better. Um, but yeah, that in a whole self printing, uh, that's another whole rabbit hole to get to. Um, but Having, I, I would say the simple answer is having a calibrated monitor um, and knowing your color spaces and knowing that uh, your files are going to definitely look different um, printed um, and trying to at least getting some of the, you know, maybe you might have to bring up shadows a little bit more for the print um, and opening up the exposure a little bit more for the print, knowing uh, that like if you were to look at a photo that I have, uh, like say this photo, and then if I'm going to print it um, on the monitor, it's not going to look exactly like how it is here, right here. This is more optimized for web. Um, it's going to look a little bit different in the, on the monitor. And then I would actually have the monitor. I, I could press my monitor into different calibrations. And then when I go to uh, like calibrated for printing, the monitor actually looks a lot darker. And so then I know I have to start opening up the shadows a little bit more. The photo is going to probably have to be opened up more. And the monitor is kind of showing me how things, at least a, a, a good approximation of how things are going to look on the printer. And then it even comes into what type of paper I'm using and things like that. But um, yeah, things are going to look different. It's going to be hard to get an exact, uh, you know, duplicate of that photo that you see on the web into a print so you will you know at least you might have to do some some slight adjustments to to get it to print as close as possible to what you're going to see displayed on your monitor and maybe on the web so yeah kind of a long-winded answer but yeah and any other questions uh, yes jamie oh go ahead sandy this might be a good time to say that we do offer um uh, John Watts to do printing for you. He's a, a um, master printer. So he knows all of the stuff that Roger's talking about. So if you don't want to print your own or you don't want to take it to Costco, which we recommend not doing because, um, uh, you know, John is just so fabulous with printing. Uh, he does a print special, uh, you know, during the 
uh, towards the end of the competition, once you get uh, alerted that you've been um, passed on to the next round. So keep your eye open for that. Okay. Uh, Janie would like to know what cameras you're both using. Um, well, cameras don't really matter. Every I, I'll just say, I'll prefi prefix this with uh, just about every modern camera is great. You can, you can get excellent photos with just about every modern camera. Um, I use uh, Fuji. I, actually, I use several different cameras, but right now my primary camera is a, I use a Fuji X-T3 uh, and an X-T1 I've used. It's a crop sensor camera. So for a landscape photographer, it's not really something a lot of landscape photographers use. They tend to like uh, full, fr full frame censored cameras, but I do, I use, a, a, I've been using Fuji cameras from the last, I would say like almost six, seven years now. Um, I just like them because uh, the portability um, just reminds me of old, uh, I used to use old film cameras, Nikon old, F, old FM2, um, that I used to carry around with me all the time uh, when I used to hike many, many, many years ago. Um, but yeah, I use a Fuji system, works out great, but you, you, Sony, Nikon, any of those systems can get you just as, just as much as well photos as any, as any other system. So, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, my, I'm a, a wildlife photographer and yeah. I don't use, I don't shoot a lot of landscapes with my camera. I use a Right now, I have three camera uh, Canon uh, 1D Mark IV bodies that I'm still using. I have not gone digital yet, although I did purchase my first, I mean, not digital, uh, mirrorless. I did purchase my first mirrorless camera uh, just shortly ago. So I am transitioning into mirrorless, uh, but um, I'm using a cropped sensor also, but that's because I need more reach for wildlife. So that's what's been working for me. Awesome. Well, I think we'll probably cut it off at this point. Um, I just thank you, Roger and Sandy, so much for all you do. I forgot to mention, they both volunteer all their time. So all the, judge, all the judges volunteer, they volunteered their time tonight. And um, gosh, so much to learn. And it's so great to, to have you and all your knowledge. And also it, it shows like how complicated photography really is. It's not just like, you know, shoot your camera and maybe you'll get lucky, but um, there's, there's definitely a skill involved. And um, I feel like I've learned so much, but um, thank you everyone. The uh, information for the photo contest will be up probably next week. Right now it's still the old photo contest stuff. I'm working hard to get it on the website and all the rules, everything will be up there. So check our website next week. That's the abf.org and if you have any questions or concerns or questions anything that you need feel free to email me it's jamie at the abf.org or info at the abf.org i have two emails so um, i'm happy to help with anything you need thank you so much everyone thanks everybody great happy shooting yeah hope to see everybody out there too so great <laughs>